Calling All Explorers is a podcast from the Harvard Innovation Laboratory in Boston. Your hosts are Harvard Business School alumnus Ronald Terrazas and me, Harvard junior Jessica Pizzolides. Along with Dr. Gordon Chu, we are co-founders of iLab member Fingra, a for-profit public benefit corporation dedicated to discovery, development and commercialization of materials that can transform humanity's ideas of sustainability and ecology. Dr. Chu is our regular guest. He is a globally recognized scientist who is author or co-author of 41 international patents, many dealing with the wonder material graphene. He is a distinguished alumnus of Harvard Business Analytics Program and of Wharton's Advanced Management Program. Hi, Dr. Chu. Hi, Jesse. Um, well, welcome back for the final episode of our MILES acronym. Um, and today we'll be talking about the letter S. Yes, um, the letter S. And just to remind everyone that we had M-I-L-E and now we're going to S, right? And MILES stands for distance. But I had introduced that one problem with distance is you might end up getting zero displacement mm-hmm. um, or displacing yourself at the wrong target. And one of the E's that we talked about on the last set was education is important, but from an expansionary mindset education, not from a restrictive education, and to always keep time as a common denominator because you cannot go back in time. I'll show you today some magic is that we will not be able to go back to when you hit the record button. Right, nobody can go back. Even the listeners and people who li- who who study this, no one can go back. You can only go forwards. So, the philosophy will govern everything. So, I'm going to begin by going into that S, which is instead of status. If you read the book Unfair Advantage, it's unfair advantage for entrepreneurs, but not for explorers. And um, and and my v- version of the S would not be status because many things that have happened to me uh, that that had tremendous exponential returns did not come with status. It came with the approach of how do I be strategic? How do I in, incorporate so that when I, do, when I say something, when I want to do something, I add in so that it can do this. Right, so you ha- you add in why are you doing it? You keep asking why, and then more recently, I have to do this, Jesse, because this is so transformative in my own life as far as explaining some of the things that happened with with you and and anyone listening in is singing to raise your awareness, mm-hmm. right? And not reading to raise your awareness, but singing because singing, uh, especially a cappella. You have to remember the lyrics and the the, the tune of the song, right? And yeah. then that will change your awareness of how you deliver the words when the words are already there, uh, the lyrics are there, but how do you deliver it so that it reaches another S word, the soul of the listener, as well as your soul, right? How do you get deeply inside? So that's very different from status. And the goal is your unfair advantage as an explorer is to, one, is never be lost. If you're lost as an explorer, can you imagine what that would do? <laughs> lost in what sense, though? I guess like, like in some ways it's kind of counter to the definition of it as long as it's, you know, in the right direction of displacement. Um, well, as an explorer, you might forget your roots. Why are yeah. you doing this? And then you might end up going, landing in a place where you start singing Elton John's song, right? About <laughs> goodbye yellow brick road. Why Why are we, you know, what was it? I better, I should have stayed on the farm. <laughs> Let me <laughs> not go there, right? And and so once upon a time, you had interviewed me once, um, not for the podcast, but just for, for introductory purposes. And I shared with you that if you gave Superman a desk job, Yes. which really happens, right? In the story of Superman, then then, then you've largely diminished the, like what Superman is supposed to do, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And, and status can sometimes do that to you. Mm. 
Right. Yeah. And what in what capacity would you say that? Oh, so many, so many examples of this. Um, but um, sometimes, like you might have two, uh, a set of parents that don't have any background, and then suddenly they 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 have a child who transforms the world. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to bring us back to a time in um, in 1966 um, of a person who walked uh, on space as a pilot. And I'm not very good at this because I, I'm, I'm still learning about this, but he's an American former astronaut, engineer, fighter, and pilot. Okay. And, and, and his name is Buzz Aldrin. Now, I don't know if Buzz Lightyear right, you know, is from because of Buzz Aldrin, but notice the similarity, right? I, I don't know a lot of things. So I'm going to explore with you guys, um, you know, the, 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 the concept. He's, 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 he was in the 1969 Apollo 11 mission. He went to MIT. He became the second person to walk on the moon um, after Neil Armstrong. So everyone knows Neil, but, but Buzz Aldrin uh, Buzz Lightyear, uh -huh. so so um, so he you know he he earned his doctorate of science degree in astronautics from MIT, and he became selected at NASA's astronaut group three. Uh, he he had the nickname Doctor Rendezvous, right, uh, from other fellow astronauts. But see, what's interesting is who do you think his parents were, right? And and what was he you know wh where was he born? Where, how, where did he grow up? He actually grew up in New Jersey, same state I'm in, right? I, I, I grew up in New Jersey too. That doesn't mean I'm, 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 I'm special. It's just, it's just giving you information, right, about someone. Now, his, um, his parents um, lived in a, in a neighboring town called Montclair, um, and his father was an Army aviator, right, so he flew a plane, an assistant commander of the Army's test pilot school. Um, from 1919 to 1922, and then left the army in 1928 to become an executive at Standard Oil. Mm -hmm. All right, so so basically, his father wasn't an astronaut, although connected to the military and other things. <laughs> the, the the history doesn't mention a lot about his mother, right? But you know, it's um he paved his own. Yeah, so extraordinary people can come from ordinary. And extraordinary people can also have ordinary offspring. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So it Happy makes sense. Winning hands. Exactly. So so that's what I have an issue about status, is that status in the book talks about this as a key differentiator. Um, and a lot of research shows rich will be richer, but that's only one side of the equation. I've shared a different side is that you not necessarily, right? Yeah, and, and, no, and I, I think it's, it's yeah. you know, I think the biggest thing, you know, I, from, you know, my experience here as well, it's the common denominator of the people that I think will, you know, be most successful generally are just those that will make the most of the resources offered to them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a common misconception of, you know, the demographic of the students here that um, at Harvard, rather that, you know, everyone kind of came from these big families and, you know, big legacy. But in reality, like, it doesn't matter where anyone came from, whether it was from, you know, kind of a small village in, you know, Africa or whether it was, you know, a big London private school or, you know, these like, you know, schools in New York, as long as, you know, every student had made the most of what was offered to them. I think that's what puts one on, on a path um, to play their cards. Right. That's right. That's right. So, so when you start looking at the, the, um, the condition for this um, unfair advantage, I like to focus on, you know, not the status because the typewriter had a lot of status and it now no longer has a purpose, right? <laughs> the, the physical typewriter. Um, the handheld camera is, uh, you know, has largely been, many of them have been replaced by the smartphone, right? And when you use an explorer's mindset, think about what status, you know, oh, my father is so-and-so or I... I, I, um, you know, when, 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 you know, I, I, I come from this background. What does that do to help you solve tough technology issues? Barely anything. In fact, no. it might be a distraction, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So that sets the stage for us of why I'm so anti-status as a, as a, 
Um, it's not our unfair advantage as an explorer. Now, what can you do to improve and, and gain your unfair advantage? First of all, it is providing a service and a solution that works. That's what you need to do as an explorer. If your solutions don't work, then um, yeah, you're an explorer, but you know you didn't really create anything. Offer much. Yeah, right. And you will largely be forgot be forgotten, right? So so the world is measuring it based on that. So the more solutions you provide, the more it looks like, wow, this is not a one hit wonder. But you do need the first wonder, right? You need the first hit in order to to then um, move yourself. And the other S word is I found is very important to impact the soul. Now to give credit to where this is coming from. This came from some graduates of the Berkeley College of Music and the uh, Juilliard School of Music, where these individuals had found ways to not only attract an audience, but to take the techniques that their teachers gave them, get into Juilliard, get into these places, and then to further their, themselves to the stratospheres, like getting a Fulbright in music, and then going from there to then perform at the Met but then I'm in the class with them now, and I'm 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 a visiting scholar, and I'm I'm looking at what their problem is, and they all say the same thing: that their biggest problem is the same techniques that got them to where they are restrict them from going further. Hmm. And you say, why would you need to go further? Well, if you're not going further, then what what is the point? Just plateau, that you, right? That means you peaked. Right, and it's over. But as a musician, as an artist, you you strive to go like, how much further can I go? Can I achieve? And mm -hmm. so you don't you don't you don't end game, right? That's the other E we try to talk about, making sure that we don't use end gaining because while goal setting is good, but it's also restrictive. So we have to not end gain. We have impacting the soul. Imagine that, right? So the singer may want to explore songwriting because it gives a different potential energy than singing cover songs, right? And look at what all these individuals are doing. They're they're going to become the super girl, super boy, super woman, super man yeah. because the 10,000 hour rule. If you spend your 10,000 hours on mega potential energy differences that are more vast than than your prior one, and you keep raising that bar, eventually you're your own competition, right? And it's no longer a competition. You're just raising that threshold. And so we owe it to our humanity to put time into exploration. Absolutely. It's, it's our, it's again, goes back to that kind of, you know, making the most of what's available to you and not settling for, for a plateau or to accept mm. the bounds um, placed upon. So. Well, I'm going to then share with you the other S word. So because there's so many S words to cover, um, systems and societies. So, you know, at Harvard undergrad, this is a system and society. You, 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 none of you have, um, have achieved anything yet. Um, but you have gotten one achievement, which is you're put together in, at, at Harvard. Now, um, I have run into, because of the executive education side, a completely other system where everybody who's at Harvard and the other one is Wharton are all successful at, mm -hmm. at a job. And, and if they're at the job, the job actually pays for the executive education. So you're in the C-suite and you're successful um, and you already have a family and you have a career. So you added a lot of things on there. And what is Harvard and Wharton going to teach you or teach us? Whereas I was there and I have to summarize it as they taught us how to do kindergarten again. Okay. Because, because none of us know really like when we were in kindergarten, it was very random, right? How do you be friends for life? I see. And you felt as though your, your education here was more of a interpersonal kind of endeavor rather than extremely I double click on that, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it was extremely so. It, it actually, actually, like, imagine if the grades and the and even like what answers you give, um, are no longer 
um, that no longer relevant from a competition standpoint. And if the the program or your 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 cohort and um, and your section, it, that all determines like what do you do with each other afterwards? Right. No. Right. Because because we already know that you're all successful. So would you want to be working with successful people? Right. You do. But will the successful people want to work with you? And that's yeah. all governed on what you say in class. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that's the <laughs> yeah, time they have with you. Right. So that's what the professors who teach in your undergrad and also teach the master's side, the MBA side, will, will said is that um, and they they actually highlighted me saying, you know, um, make sure you don't send out this recording, right? <laughs> to me, right? Because they said that what we're saying to you um, cannot be what we share to the undergrad or the master's program because um, because it's not their time to hear that. And that's why I added timing into it. It wasn't that what they're sharing isn't valuable to the undergrad or the MBA, but in order to be focused on getting the job and getting those things and going through life, you do need to be extremely targeted at that phase in your life. But at the other phase is once you've achieved that, you actually have to be able to have the mindset of um, working with others because you're a leader, right? Imagine if you couldn't motivate the people in your company to like, all they wanted was to be you and you're you're in the C-suite, then you actually don't have a system, a team that is focused and driven on a certain effect. You can't project that culture. So the greatest challenge will be at that success, how do you move others to be with you and to be aligned with you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So now that we're and now we're segmenting into the so we have the soul, we have the system, we have the society, and then we have now something really hard. I'm going to throw something really, really difficult for us, which is say you're me and you come into something which is a 23rd century material. Okay. Graphic, right. And what century are we in now? Not the twenty third. <laughs> right, we're we're in the twenty first with a twenty third century material. Now, you know what our biggest problem is? If we took graphene and we put it into sneakers, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what century were sneakers around? No, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were they they're not. They were around before twenty twenty three. So they were they were around in the nineteen eighties, in the nineteen seventies. You had sneakers. So we're actually not, and if I picked fishing poles, well, what century were those around, right? So so you start thinking about, we're actually going backwards. We're taking a 23rd century material and we're putting it into uh, 19th century thinking, Yeah. right? And now, is that a problem? It is if you measure it from potential energy, but it's not if you're looking at it, oh, maybe we can sell fishing poles. So see, that is where it becomes my finger off. And the thinking and, and, and how how many iterations, how many startups I had to go through before I finally got it. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Y- you know, um the the we're our, what we learn and what we're exposed to becomes a restriction because it also affects our story. I'm gonna give another system in society for you. Um, how much time do we have? Um, I believe another 10 or so. Okay. Let's, let's, let's keep going. Right. So I'm going to share with you a system in society, uh, and it's called Hong Kong. And this was about, you know, 20 years ago for me, 23 years ago uh, to be exact. And I have this offer to say something on the radio for radio television, Hong Kong. And I was a lowly MD PhD candidate who happens to be consulting for a lot of dermatologists because I was in the dermatology section. Um, and, and the thing I said was that in your dishwashing detergent and your dishwashing soap and a lot of skincare uh, for washing the face contains an ingredient that is shared. And this shared, this shared ingredient, sodium lauryl sulfate, at that level um, can lead to wrinkles. Okay. And that thing went viral. I'm sure. I'm sure it did. 
Yeah, it was like one minute and it goes viral. There wasn't any YouTube or anything like that at that time. Um, and it was, we were still doing like these chat systems, but it went viral. And Hong Kong, let me share with you how unique it is. If if you know about a vegetable called kale. Yes. Very good for you, very healthy. But in at Whole Foods, it might be like a dollar nine, $2.99 for a bunch in a, in a, another grocery store that's not at the level of Whole Foods, maybe a dollar ninety nine, but in Hong Kong, there's this place called City Super, that for organic kale would be seven uh, to eight dollars for like a a smaller bunch, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, for like three hundred grams or so or four hundred grams, it's just not it's not going to be a lot, and um and it's and you say like how is that possible? Like Whole Foods are, is already known as whole paycheck, right? There's this uh, this aura around it. It's expensive. What is going on in Hong Kong? And Hong Kong, you know, because it was the gateway to enter into China and it was under a British system and you grew up, you know, in the British uh, education system. So you know um, that that Britain has some very expensive shopping places. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Hong Kong is this gateway where if you're working at Nike or you're working at, uh, you're an executive at Kraft and others, you, we all had to have a presence in Hong Kong. And I didn't know this. I'm just giving you what I had learned. And here's a system in society where if you're making 200,000 euros and you're willing to go to Hong Kong with your family to represent the company, um, we'll give you 450,000 euros. So you have an extra 250,000 euros to play around. And what are you going to do with all that extra money? So Hong Kong became a place that serviced um, all these executives. And you have 13 Michelin star restaurants within walking distance of each other. Wow! You had a street that would never sleep. The whole street would never sleep. You didn't have anything. You had maid service. You don't buy clothing that like... I don't care if it was Armani or other ones. Those are like mass produced. Now, everything in Hong Kong, if you're an executive, it's tailored fit to you, to your size perfectly, only yours. Mm -hmm. A fraction of the prices. And, and you know, the, the, the types of watches inside of a store, you know, some of them are $300,000 for a watch. Crazy. Cra craziness, right? But this is not crazy in this system and society. So becoming popular with that thing going viral, I just thought, you know, I had to go there to cut my teeth and learn about things and, and what was going on. And and my my parents told me, well, you came from there, but we left because there is just, there's nothing going on there. How could there be nothing going on there? There's everything going on there, yeah. right? So, so um. So we each take very, very different stories, but the system and society, just like your section at uh, as a Harvard junior in your year is like a fine wine, right? Your, your fine wine is your year and what you make of it with your, with your classmates and things like that will determine the flavor and the different year, the same professor, by the way, will say different things. Do you believe that? Because the same professor might say something different in another class. Well, that's only natural, right? And given the context of what they say it in, will be very different, which is why calling explorers is so important because we are creating the context of what does it take for someone to explore this possibility and create the ecosystem around whatever their story is, right? We all have different stories, all different projects. What can you do to turn yourself into that super girl or super boy. And in Hong Kong, they wanted a lot of stuff. Now, to give you some contrast, I'm 90% illiterate in Chinese. I'm only 10% literate. Yeah. And that's actually being very generous. Like, you do not want to bring me to the karaoke, right? <laughs> right? And that's that's like a, you know that's how you lose dates right he can't sing in chinese he can't read in chinese right so, right so so yeah but the but the story after it, it went viral they they wanted me to be spa man and wow. like, 
your MD PhD candidate, spa man? Like, are you sure? Like, this is like a brand quick, quick switch thing, up. Right? right? <laughs> but you know, it's like, if you don't, if I don't do spa man, I will just never be spa man. Like, you know, do, this is not like, do you want to be Superman? No, they wanted me to be spa man. So then every radio interview was here's spa man, right? <laughs> but you do it. Who would right? have thought, who right? would have thought that your, your research into, into this particular um, substance would have led to this? Right. So the S word, right. Is that you don't do it on status. You It's about being silly and the willingness to be silly. So when 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 I did that, the next thing that happened was, would you like to build the next Whole Foods concept of living healthy in in in, in, in Hong Kong for the ones who realize that eating American top quality healthy foods can make you pretty? Because it started with the pretty stuff, the Barbie stuff, and all that stuff, and then it's spa man, and then it migrated into can you? And then that's when I the degree I was going for the MD PhD no longer made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And then the investor, the new, the other investor said, you know, go learn whatever you'd like. We'll cover it all. Wow. Right. So what did I have to learn? I had to learn naturopathic medicine and then transform that into a beauty stint because later on I was like Demi Moore's brand where she's, you know, she's at Disney and I have to, I'm the spokes doctor for that brand. Right. The brand that never made it, by the way, <laughs> but still, it's but dope. still, <laughs> but still, it was like, if I wasn't there, the opportunity wouldn't occur. Right. It just wouldn't happen. And location. it's not about status. Right. <laughs> yes, it's location, but it wasn't driven by location. It was driven by silliness. Because when I shared, why is it silly? Because when I shared this with my, with friends, mentors, they said, this is stupid. This is crazy. This is like, what are you doing? Right. If you just follow MD, PhD, you'll have this standard life. And mm -hmm. I viewed it as yeah, it's standard. And I don't even know who I'm going to end up marrying. But later on, because it was on the media, people could read my girlfriend who became my wife. She read about me in the hair salon. Uh -huh. Now, you know what that changes to your like your dating experience? If if they read about that, it's like you could do no wrong. <laughs> You get the secret you menu. On a pedestal. Oh yeah, you you have access to the secret menu. What's the secret menu? Everything becomes different if you access the secret menu. So so the S, right? There's so many S's I threw in this for S is like the secret menu for graphene is to use the 23rd century material for 23rd century solutions, not 19th century, right? But only through doing the silly stuff in Hong Kong would I then be able to, like, there's things I got from there, from my wife, girlfriend, to to uh, my godmother. Right? My godmother was the was the multimedia megastar in Hong Kong. Really? And, wow. Yeah, but but she wasn't my godmother like until all this was done i'm talking about she became my godmother only about three four years ago but <laughs> but it was like at that time right she was we were both hired because i was i was hired into spa man and she was the pr person for spa spa man so she's pring me but not as my godmother and the reason the reason marjorie her, her name is marjorie marjorie became my godmother because i asked her you know, we, we stayed in contact and I asked her and I didn't do it for me. I did it for my daughters <laughs> because I, I said, you know, I can't give you any, 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 anything like that because I didn't come from the high society, but it would be good for my daughters. So I said, here, you know, then, then you could have a great godmother, but I would do silly things like that. And being silly opens the mind differently. You could open it, you know, and then when I came to wall street, there was this, this individual graduated from Harvard University uh, for his MBA, and um, and his name is William Potter. And William had this firm that he um, he, he acquired through Robert Meredith. And Robert Meredith was a managing director at Morgan Stanley, and um, you can find all of his all of his details out there. And he created this boutique firm that had just like the strangest deals that you can imagine, like film deals, that's Robert right. Meredith, right? And, and the, and, or, or 
you know, could graphene be used for anti-counterfeit solutions? That's Robert R. Meredith. So you would come to them, or if you had a gold mine in Alaska that you couldn't access, you didn't bring that to Goldman Sachs. You brought it to Robert R. Meredith. And mm -hmm. coming after after Hong Kong, I was I was a I was the scientific advisor to Robert R. Meredith. That's so interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I would then look at deals, and I went. I ran into a guy. I would. I, there was a guy who who wanted to record the dreams from last night, and that was his startup. And he also had, you know, he had all kinds of things on uh, that was capable for him. But see, this is like strange. Like you know, it's not just silly for us, but also strange. You do yeah. strange things, right? And the graphene deal that came out of that time period, Robert R. Meredith was a deal where there was a graphite mining company that junior so they're not really mining but they would need to raise like 300 million dollars and my whole thing was i'd like to see whether or not we can make graphene from graphite and skip the mining process and so that was one of the deals where where i i would end up meeting people in wall street i then went to singapore to pull this off. And they said, we've been waiting for you. Now at Princeton, I presented the same idea because it's convenient. I live in New Jersey, right? And they said, we don't know anything about doing this. This sounds really weird, uh, very strange. And when I brought it to Singapore in 2012, it became a reality. That means I brought it to Singapore in 2010, 2011, and it became possible. So coming back to the United States in about 2008, and then by 2010, having that deal, and between 2008 to 2010, 10 deals that back-to-back -back had 10x returns. Wow. What is the formula for that? Like, how do you do that? And then, and then at the height of the biggest one, that becomes your deal and you're the vice president, you're the founder. And how do you do that? You do it by being silly and by being strange. You don't do it with status. <laughs> right? At least that's what happened to me. Yeah. Right? So I want us to be even stranger because Fingra is a lot stranger than what I had done before. Fingra targets 23rd century. What's going to happen in the 23rd century? Do you know by in 60 years or so what the population of the earth will be? No. No? They don't talk about that at Harvard? Not not. not. <laughs> right, right. So so that but that isn't that something related to math and affects everything? Sure, as, as a tool, I suppose. So population of world in 20, um, let's, I guess we'll add 60 years, 2080, right? Roughly, okay. So the estimated population in the world, I just typed this in the Google, by the way, it says 10.4 billion people. Wow. India will be the most populous country of that year with an estimated 1.6 billion, followed by China, second pot largest population. Now imagine if everybody wanted to have steak we don't want chicken anymore because we, we've elevated can you imagine how many cows we'd have to have mm -hmm. to support right? and you know if you say to them you know it's not a good idea to have steak because um we're all going to roast <laughs> the temperature would be bad these cows poop all the time so then a solution to be silly would be imagine if you and i jesse created a solution where the cows only pooped once a month right we manage, we manage to change the cows. They poop once a month. So it's only 12 times a year. We also do the same. So the earth becomes better. What a silly idea. But by being silly, we laugh. We have a good time. Okay. And that leads to the explorer mindset coming out is that sometimes you're silly, sometimes you're strange, but overall, you're never, ever going to be egoistic, right? Because you want to have teamwork and work together. You also want to sing because when you sound bad, that's great. Then no one's going to, you know, we just, and that's what we did at Wharton AMP. We sang. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have, do you guys sing with, uh, in, in, in class? Do you have this uh, gathering? At, that, so at the executive level, imagine singing. Well, right? I, right? Can't, I can't quite say I've had, had that experience, but I can, I can imagine how that kind of brings out, um, a sort of different level to the just the mere words that are being communicated. Um, Have you ever done any movies before? 
in what sense? Like, have you been in a movie or have I you have been not. filmed? Have you been a director? No, right? No, no, so right. That's truly how most of the executive level at Harvard and uh, attending Harvard executive management or, or Wharton, none of us have any uh, filming experience. So they would pick something like that and then make us have groups and film each other's movies. And we would all watch each other's films on mm -hmm. movie night, but we'd have to learn how to make, make a movie. And they actually brought in people with that expertise to teach us within three days. Wow. Quick right? learning. Curve. Now, now <laughs> that is just going to like, you're not going to have any ego because you're all going to mess up, right? But messing up. And then, then that we had a startup competition in there and the competition was to do social enterprise. Now you take someone uh, one, one graduate out of out of Wharton is um is was the CEO of uh, of Walgreens, right? So um so Rosalind um she uh, she was the CEO of Walgreens, and then you put them into filming, not my section year, but you know basically you'd make them do these things, a social enterprise. How can you do something that will help the world as opposed to? just help yourself and elevate up the ladder because in that thinking you actually learn about thinking more broadly and more peripherally than to be laserly of course uh, and i think you know to go back to your silly point um you know i think there's something so profound about that kind of childlike exploration where you know as a kid when you're learning there's no shame or no kind of repercussion mm -hmm. to keep on asking why and you know come up with new ideas you know there's something that kind of social pressure to always feel like you know you're asking the right questions is you know completely lost as a kid and I think that you know in the pursuit of being an explorer you kind of need to harness that more childlike silly yeah. question asking process um the right question Jesse is to be able to ask the question right exactly. without any restrictions yeah exactly and so that is why Fingra outclasses all of the other startups I've ever done because it's asking a question of what can we do in the 23rd century? Because when I wrote 2080 into the Google, right, it said 10.4 billion, but 2080 is not the 23rd century. Do we actually get to the 23rd century? Right. So and what what at what point, what's going to happen? Right? What's going to happen if it, because it's pushing our minds beyond this and to think in that dynamic will we still be learning what we learned in high school that you want you learned in high school and what i learned in high school because what we saw in the time period um that we're in was only a fraction within the same age that came out of an age of let's say silicon and plastics and the the ai is just starting now but the it's the coming of an age where things will be different. And if you can't think in that way, then what happens is you're not innovating. So then you're not going to get the miles you need to land in a, in a location that becomes of service to humanity. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And, and I think as well as, you know, harnessing just, you know, in terms of being of service to humanity, like, using the markets to solve these social problems, like actually looking where your know, demand is right now, like not kind of, you know, being afraid to, you know, make, make change through profitable enterprises instead of through nonprofit spaces. Um, you know, I think that's an important distinction as well to think of. The whole world is very soon is about to see Jesse Pizzolides present representing Fingra at Harvard's, you know, President's Innovation Challenge. And you are going to look the strangest because you're going to be talking about uranium and how to offset that. You're going to be talking about creating structures on the moon, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and mirth structures, you know, the moon's gravitational force is one sixth the earth. So to blast off the moon and send it back, send stuff back to the, to, to the, the earth is going to be very favorable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're going to be talking about water bears. And yet, you know, you're going to start off by sharing about the asphalt because everyone understands potholes and, you know, but, but potholes now suddenly became, do you remember when we first started potholes? It was like, wow, that's such a great idea. And now look how, how, how 
how diminished it is compared to the 23rd century solutions we're talking about, right? Of course. Yeah. Um, but Dr. Chu, thank you so, so much um, for today. That was a great episode on rounding off um, the acronym of MILES from the unfair advantage. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? No, until next time, right? Until next time. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for listening to another episode of Calling All Explorers. To find out more, please visit fingra.com. That is P-H-E-N-E-G-R-A dot com. Thank you.